Lovely to be with you all this morning. Love coming here. Love this church. Love the unity I feel. Seem to like each other here. Is that right? Yeah. He likes you anyway. We're quite fun, isn't we? Yes. Good man. So, um, Justin said I could just talk about what I wanted to this morning. <laughs> so, it's always about the endless, really. Um, I would love to talk to you about a quite serious parable, Luke 16, chapter 19 to 31. Um, it's the rich man uh, and Lazarus, and it covers some very, very serious things. We, we're going to look at comfort for, for those who are suffering, Christians who are suffering. We're going to have a little look at the warning against uh, love of, of, of money. We're going to have a look at the, the reality of, of heaven and the reality of hell and, and the importance of the Great Commission. Your brother here shared getting on with building um, kingdom here. So quite serious stuff. So Justin, just don't give me a free choice. <laughs> 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 you don't want me to cover these, these deep masters. <laughs> so before I get there, like I said, we're going to hit some topics that, that might be a little bit uncomfortable. But I've got to tell you a little story. You know, my one of my uh, mentors, uh, John Putman, he always starts with a story just to lighten it a little bit. So <laughs> I'm just, you, you know the story he does that? I'm going to tell you a story. When I was Barack Obama, you know what I mean? Yeah, okay, yeah, yeah, yeah. So I've got these friends um, uh, called Keith and Katie Morse. You know them? They were in Kingsgate for some years. There was an American family. We always have Americans with us. They've got this base in, um, in, in various Edmonds, and they stay with us for three years, and they go. So they're with us. They're just wonderful. But what I find with the Americans is they are so casual. With the way they, they raise their kids, they're, they're very freeing in some ways. So, for example, um, after a couple of months of knowing them, they went back to America and left their kids with us, who we didn't really know. <laughs> we didn't really know them, they left them with us. But, uh, this is unusual. I wouldn't leave my children with people and fly across the Atlantic that I didn't really know. Then we went to visit them in the summer, it was really great to see them, they doing so well. But I noticed that this casualness has continued. So they all know how to use this family shotgun. Yep. Yeah, I know. They know how to use a shotgun. So that a rattlesnake comes in the garden, the 12-year-old can shoot it. It's what the 14-year-old practices <laughs> driving without his father in the car, so that when he, he is the age for driving, he's got a head start. It's very, very chill. Out. They've got a kitten, my little daughter, Tara. Five-year-old kind of loves his kitten. So I said, you know the kind of guy that has a, has a kitten. You're really just not that kind of guy. He goes, well, I'll tell you a story. I was out one day. For dinner, and there's this little cat, it was a stray cat, so the you know, kids felt sorry for it, so we just took it home. And then the cat bred with another cat, and so we got this cat back. <laughs> wow, you just don't parent the way I parent. <laughs> do. I need to make sure this is a pedigree cat. Has it uh, got it all its jobs? Has it got certificates? Can I breed it in the future and make some money? So, very, very different. But they are very, very strict about one particular matter. And I was surprised about this. So they've got a swimming pool in their garden. And they don't let they, they don't they won't even let a twenty or a thirty year old swim in that pool without another person there. I said, Keith, and you're so strict about everything so, so casual about everything, what's the big deal about the pool? Because I'm actually in Florida a lot of people join in pools. Um, because it's well they do, and it's quiet, you can't hear them. So they're super strict about the pool. So these are these are parents that are shepherding their kids, they're giving their kids freedom, but at the same time, because they know about the seriousness of drowning, they are super strict because they love their kids. And we're gonna hit some topics today. We're gonna hit we're gonna actually hit topics of hell today in part of the sermon. And I just wanna share with you that whenever we hit this topic, this the gospel is essential because hell is real. The gospel is essential because hell is real. And I, think, I find that churches are taking this doctrine on it because it's offensive. Even even churches, even John Stott took the doctrine on it, of all people. Did you know that? Yeah, annihilation. Annihilism. Gospel is essential because hell exists. And when I share this with you today, I am I'm from Northern Ireland, you recognize my accent, I'm sure. When I was flying over to Florida to see my friends, um, we just moved here to look at things called Belfast. And it was, uh, I watched on the plane, I didn't like it, and it wasn't the, the Belfast I grew up in, I missed the Troubles. But my parents grew up in the Troubles, and um, some, some sad things in there. But one of the things that really got me was this preacher. He was preaching about, about this topic of hell, and he seemed to be enjoying it. 
Whenever, whenever you see this topic come up in Scripture, you need to see it from a good shepherd, the Lord Jesus Christ. Good shepherd. He desires none to perish, but all to come to repentance. Why would you die, O oh, house of Israel? Turn and live, the prophet Ezekiel tells us. In the same way, he can hear you saying, care for the poor. God says, this is real. Don't let me go there. Don't let me go there. So when I hit that part, you might wince a little bit in your seats, but I want you to remember the heart of the good shepherd who showed us he cares by dying our place for our sins. Is that okay? Yeah. Let's read the text. I'm familiar with the story, I'm sure, but the Bible says, and this is the best bit of the sermon because it is inspired by the Holy Spirit. It says, there was a rich man who was clothed in purple and fine linen, and who was who feasted sumptuously every day. At his gate was laid a poor man named Lazarus, and he was covered with sores. He desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, even the dogs came and they licked his sores. The poor man died, and he was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died, and he was buried, and in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes, and he saw Abraham far off, and Lazarus at his side. And he called out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am in anguish in this flame. Abraham said, Child, remember that in your lifetime you received your good things, and Lazarus in like manner bad things. But now he is comforted here, and you are in anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able and none may cross from there to us and he said that I beg you father to send him to my father's house for I have five brothers so that he may warn them lest they also come into this place of torment but Abraham said they have Moses and the prophets let them hear them and he said no father Abraham if someone goes to them from the dead they will repent he said to him if they do not hear Moses and the prophets Neither will they be convinced if someone should raise from the dead. So we're going to we're going to meet the characters to this parable. So character number one is the rich man. This comes at the end of, the, of, 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 of several teachings on, on <coughs> wealth and on riches. We find the uh, prodigal son wasted his inheritance. We find that the dishonest manager wastes his employer's goods. And we also learn something in scripture which is interesting. About uh, the Bible said, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. But this means that I can do all things that God has called me to do through Christ who gives me strength. Now, if I wanted to walk through that wall, unless the Lord called me to walk through that wall, what's going to happen is, we're going to have each other. Can walk through the wall. I can do all things through Christ. No, I can't walk through the wall. Why? It's impossible. Can I look through the wall? No. My father leaves a beam to my eyes. No. I can't do those things. But there's something else that is impossible for me to do. And this, this, is quite, this is quite scary. It's impossible for me, and it's impossible for every one of you, to serve God and money. It's impossible to serve God and serve money, because one will have the throne of your heart. Money will have the throne of your heart. God will be under it. But God and money will be under it. We've all got to deal with this, no matter how much wealth we have. So this rich man is an example of one who did not love money. Sorry, did not love God with the money. It says there was a rich man. Now we know, guys, this is really important. This rich man ends up in Hades. This is the place where the unrighteous dead go before the final judgment. Right. You think he went there because he was rich? No. He doesn't go there because he's rich. Absolutely. The Bible says, in this life you receive good things. Wealth in itself is a good thing. Because wealth gives us choices. It gives families choices. It gives churches choices. It allows us to be able to bless people like Lazarus who we want to meet in a minute. It allows us to choose to meet in a building like this. I mean, it just belongs to you guys. It's your, it's your property, isn't it? Fantastic. 
you're able to bless the church by using this wonderful building. And we rent the building and it's leaving this morning. It's a lovely drawing. Yeah. No, it's leaving. Oh, is it? Over there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> that was nearly. Up and towels down. Move the sofa. With that was nearly a good illustration. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> nearly. Yeah. But wealth is a good thing. Wealth gives us a choice. <coughs> wealth gives us choice. But this rich man, unfortunately, uh, did not did not honor and worship God. Money was a problem. How do we know this? It says here he was clothed in purple and fine linen. He's wearing the best clothes. And what did he do every day? He feasted, it says here, sumptuously every day. Meaning he ate the best food every day and he ate more than he needed every day. That's a feast. It's Christmas Day every day for this guy. And the problem was that at his gift was with a poor man named Lazarus. So a rich man here, he's wearing the best clothes, he's <coughs> feasting sumptuously every day, while a poor friend here is starving. He doesn't. he doesn't. The rich man does not go to hell because he's rich. The rich man goes to hell because he's a sinful man. And we've all sinned, and this guy's sin. Adultery's not named here. Murder's not named here. But his lack of care for the poor is clear that he's sinned. James 4 17. Whoever knows the right to do it and fails to do it, for him it is a sin. So the rich man, he's rich. He loves wealth. He loves eating the good food. He loves wearing the best clothes. Doesn't give a toss about poor John. All right. Now we're going to meet another guy. We're going to meet Lazarus. Now Lazarus here. Um, Lazarus is a bit of a, an interesting one. You know, he's the only person in any of Jesus' parables with a name. And let's have a look at his life. He's living a tough life. So Lazarus, the Bible says, is covered with sores. I took my family desperate yesterday to stand up with my family that got here for our lives. And my little girl fell into some nettles. Yeah, so a lot of this can't get up her leg. This is November, nettles aren't actually all that bad, but it's enough to really upset her. Lazarus here, Lazarus here is covered with all of your body with sore bits. Now that, that's his life, that's what he's got. And he's also a crook. So he's covered in sorbets and he hasn't got he hasn't got well, he hasn't got the ability to choose what he's going to eat. Because the question that for a second, we haven't got the ability to choose to eat. That's very, very good. Wealth gives us choice, which wealth money gives us choice. He hasn't even got the ability to choose to eat. But the Bible says he desired to be fed with what fell from the rich man's table. And then this bit's awful for an image bearer of God. Even the dogs came and they licked his sores. And that's pretty tough, isn't it? Mm -hmm. Pretty tough. Covered the sore bits, no choice to eat, and dogs are licking his wounds. And yet, Lazarus, we're going to find out in a minute, he goes to heaven. And Lazarus does not go to heaven because he is poor, he does not go to heaven because he's covered in sore bits. Because all of us, the Bible says all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. So Lazarus, at some point, turns from his sin, puts his trust in the Lord Jesus, and receives forgiveness and righteousness. And yet in this life, he suffers. And just for any of you here today, I don't know all your stories, but perhaps some of you, some of you feel like Lazarus. You feel a little bit like, you know what? That's pretty tough. It's going well for them, but, but I'm coming with source. I haven't got choice. Dogs are licking my wounds. I don't know what's going on in your life. Perhaps you can relate to Lazarus and what he's going through. I want to point out that we're saying that Lazarus, he enters heaven. The Bible says that all things work together for good. We love him and are called according to his purpose. And the Bible says that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing to the glory that is to be revealed. To us. Isn't that amazing? Mm -hmm. If you're suffering at the minute, God's going to walk into your kingdom. Heaven's going to be your home. Another thing we know that our God offers that no other God offers. So money is a God. You can't serve God and money. Baal is a God. The prophet said, you're going to serve God, the Lord, you're going to serve Baal. We've got loads of gods around now. We've got Allah, we've got Buddha. We've got all sorts of gods. All over the world. I think in India, there's tons of gods. Ganesh, all over the place. 
Prakar, the perfect evening, the Prakar, shows us and cares about his suffering. Martin Luther says the incarnation shows us that. The fact that the Word became flesh, the fact that Almighty God would come into the womb of a teenage virgin, be born and lay in a in, in, in trough to feed animals, to live amongst us, to die in our place for our sins. Mm. Isn't that good? Mm. You don't look like you're good. It's okay. Amazing. What a wonderful God. What a wonderful God. The poor man died. He was carried by the angels to Abraham's side. The rich man also died and he was buried. And one of the things that I think about a lot, and things get this all the time, because I, I, I am very aware of my mortality. I think about it quite a lot. I mean, I'm nearly 40. <laughs> a bit more to go. Probably got a bit more to go. <laughs> but I, I, ever since, I've always thought about it. Even when I was a, a non Christian in my clubs, that point in the evening where you have a few drinks that shouldn't have had and looking down, trying, what's the point of all this? We're all going to die. The rich man here wears the best clothes, his life is comfort, he's got all the men to prepare, all the food, he does. The poor man dies. Solomon says, no matter whether you're wise or you're foolish, you're not. I just want to just encourage you all to think about that. What are you going to leave behind? What are you going to leave a life of like faith, like Abel did? Like long after you're gone, by faith, you still speak? Or are we going to live wasted lives? The rich man dies, he's buried, nothing can stop it happening. And in Hades, being in torment, he lifted up his eyes and saw Abraham fall off and Lazarus at his side. And this is the thing that this, this often gets taken out of the churches because it's so difficult in the world of people that we love to walk with the Lord. I do, my brothers and sisters, you guys probably do as well. And this is why I think we, we, we delete this, we rub it, we rub it out. Is that better? Yes. We delete it, we rub it out, it's hard to swallow, it's difficult, it's offensive. I cannot. Imagine this being spoken of by a senior, uh, on a television, by a senior person from, from, from an established church. I cannot imagine them speaking on this. It's so difficult, it's so hard, but it's true. Keith and Katie have a swimming pool, and they're like, guys, if you go into this pool and you can't drown, if you can't swim, you will drown. That is loving. It's not loving to say, well, if you really want to go in the pool, it's fine. It's not loving. Listen to what it's like here for this rich man. He's in Hades. He's conscious. He's conscious because he's able to look across the room and go, across the chasm and go, huh, I'm here, they're there. He's able to think. He's conscious. The Bible uses the word here, torment. Other, other ways hell is described is weeping and gnashing of teeth, outer darkness, fire. We don't know what it's like, but these are not metaphors that sound comfortable. It's not a hotel. And remember what I said to you earlier, this is from the heart of Jesus. Good shepherd. I don't want anyone to perish. But good shepherds, good fathers, tell their kids this in a way that's loving. Good pastors tell their church this in a way that's loving. Good evangelists tell people to share the gospel with in a way that's loving. We don't have any joy in seeing people go here. And listen to this. He calls out, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Of course, it isn't too late. He's asking for mercy now. Have mercy on me. And one of the things people sometimes picture is that in, in Hades, in hell, people are like, were you sorry and trying, trying to get right with God? That doesn't happen. That doesn't happen. They want to get out of it. Hades. They want to get out of hell. But listen to this. Father Abraham, have mercy on me and send Lazarus to dip the end of his finger in water and cool my tongue, for I am anguish in this pain. What he should be doing is, God, I am so sorry that I have worshipped you I am so sorry for not honouring you with my life. I am so sorry for my rebellion against you all my days. And Lazarus, I am so sorry that whenever you were at the edge of my table, getting licked by dogs, and I had everything to help you, I didn't. No. He's just commanding Lazarus through Abraham. He's giving Abraham orders. Commanding Abraham, um, 
Lazar, go get some water. And I will help you through the people who are repenting. We will continue to rebel against God. Sin is that serious. <laughs> we'll get to go up and do next time, aren't we? <laughs> it's a bit more palatable. Abraham said, Child, remember that you in your lifetime received your good things. Well, he gives choice. He made bad choices, but it was a good thing. Lazarus in like manner are bad things. But now he is comforted here in your anguish. And besides all this, between us and you, a great chasm has been fixed in order that those who would pass from here to you may not be able, and none may cross from there to us. Same way with Keith and Katie or this sort of hope. If a kid drowns in that hole, it's not coming back. After this life, once that chasm is open, there's no swapping between the two. Are you serious? <clears throat> He said, then I beg you, Father, send it to my father's house, for I have five brothers, so that he may warn them, lest they also come into this place of torment. Brothers. These brothers, obviously living a very similar life to, to the rich man, but just welcome the family, I don't know. And Abraham said, this is, I find this absolutely fascinating, guys. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. So Moses and the prophets, you know, you've got Genesis through the Malachi. You've got the history books and the wisdom books. They had the scriptures. And Abraham said, hey, that's enough. Listen to that. We, as God's people, King's Church, Stone Market, you've got, you've got Moses, you've got the prophets. You've got the wisdom literature, you've got the Psalms, and you've got the works of the apostles, Matthew, through the Revelation. We've got the word of God. That is sufficient for salvation. A miracle is not sufficient for, is not sufficient for salvation. Ten lepers healed, one comes back. How many people did Jesus feed on the day that day? When he fed five thousand men? We don't know. But there were children and on lives there too. Maybe thirty thousand people. How many in the upper room? One hundred and twenty. Abraham said, they have Moses and the prophets, let them hear them. He, he said, no, Father Abraham, if someone goes to them from the dead, they will repent. He said to him, they do not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. And of course, Jesus has demonstrated that to us. In his resurrection from the dead, the whole world didn't turn to Christ, did it? Some did. The word of God, guys, I want you to, I want to raise your, your faith, your confidence in the scriptures. They are beautiful. They are powerful. Mm. I love the fact you're reading your scriptures. Mm. Love it. In the word of God. In the word of God. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the wicked, nor stands in the seat of sinners, nor sits in the way of scoffers. His delight is in the law of the Lord, and on his law he his day and night. He yields fruit in season, leaf does not wither, all he does prosperous. And we prosper church and best in the word of God. The word of God is the power of God. The gospel, the power of God on the salvation. And that's what this church, that's what our churches are to preach and teach and get into people's lives. Get into people's lives. It's good, some, I do evangelism on the streets and some people, I go with different people. Some people say, go for the miracle question. Oh God, what would you let God do for you? That's a good thing to do. Pray for that miracle. Share the word of God. Share the word of God. If not hear Moses and the prophets, neither will they be convinced if someone should rise from the dead. Unbelief is not a intellectual problem. It really is not an intellectual problem. It's a spiritual problem. I've got uh, my grandfather was quite key to me in my faith. Like I shared last time I was here with his Bible. Is that right? I'm sure I did. Um, I've got to told you he had a twin brother, George, Uncle George. Like identical genetics. One who loves Jesus with all his heart. One who is anti Jesus with all his heart. Both like Zach, who's in intellect. The spirit of God. With great minds. And I'm reading about C.S. Lewis. And what a mind. Genius. 
I'm standing in church with a bit of Jesus. <laughs> I love the word Jesus. Francis Collins from America, the guy has a human genome project. Genius. He loves Jesus. Smart people like Richard Dawkins, they're smart, but they're foolish. They don't know Jesus. It's spiritual, not intellectual. Share the word of God. So we're